Welcome. My name is John Baker, and I'm glad you could join us today as we tackle the tough issue of active killers in our schools. Now remember, an active killer is anyone who is in the process of seeking victims and attempting to kill them, whether they have a knife, a gun, or a blunt instrument like a bat. Well, this video is part of the Lancaster Lebanon IU-13 All Hazards Plan video series that is being produced to work in conjunction with the Pennsylvania Department of Education recommended All Hazards Plan that many of our schools are currently working towards. This series is designed to address a variety of scenarios found in the new All Hazards Plan in small, bite-sized training sessions that really don't need to last much more than 20 or 30 minutes at a time. Well, within the school community, you will find a variety of recommendations for how best to respond to an active killer. And this video will recommend a variety of options for staff and students in your school that will increase everyone's chance of survival when faced with an active killer. The Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, the International Chiefs of Police Association, and the Pennsylvania State Police all have come out with their own studies and recommendations on how best to survive an active killer situation. And most of these recommendations are based on data from nearly 500 school shootings over the past 15 years. And while every incident is unique, there are common traits for both the survivors and the victims. People who can quickly analyze the situation and select a strategy that works best for them and those close by significantly increase their chance of survival. Those who flee and quickly escape the kill zone have the greatest chance of survival, and for those who can't, fortified lockdown is their best option. Well, today we will visit a typical high school campus, and we'll be joined by local law enforcement and the Lancaster County CERT team as we explore active killers in schools. Before we begin discussing active shooters, let's take a few minutes and discuss the different types of lockdowns that are most common. The first type is interior lockdowns. Interior lockdowns are announced when the threat is believed to be inside the building. And of the three types of lockdowns, we will spend the most time discussing interior lockdowns later in this presentation. The second type is exterior lockdowns. Exterior lockdowns are activated when the threat is believed to be outside the building. Any staff, students, or visitors on your school campus should immediately return to the building, and all exterior doors should be secured and checked by the staff. Classrooms with first floor exterior windows or doors should pull down the blinds to deny anyone a clear view of the class. And if there is any chance of a firearm being involved, you may also want to consider removing anyone from those classrooms and moving them to interior spaces in the event shooting would start and the windows could be penetrated. And the third type of lockdown is an administrative lockdown. Administrative lockdowns are often announced when a situation has developed that requires staff and students to simply remain in place until the situation is resolved before resuming the normal schedule. Incidences such as maintenance issues or medical staff responding to the school are reasons why we may activate an administrative lockdown. Lockdowns are just one strategy that a school can use to respond to an active killer. Today, as we discuss active killers, we need to understand what our best options are and how to enhance current procedures such as traditional lockdown. With over 15 years of data gathered regarding school shootings, we have learned a great deal about active shooters. And this data has revealed that we need to adjust our traditional thinking about lockdowns since Columbine to meet the risks that we face today in order to increase everyone's chance of survival. Enhanced lockdown is more than just locking and shutting the doors and sitting in the corner as we've done in the past. We need to barricade, fortify, and get creative. Enhanced lockdown means the student and staff must be proactive to ensure their survival. Using what is found in the classroom to make a barricade will make the shooter think twice about trying to force his way in. 
Remember that the harder you make it for him, the better chance he will bypass your room. There are other ways to keep out the intruder. Using something as simple as a backpack, your own leverage makes forcing the door open much more difficult. Another way to prevent forced entry is to use a belt or purse strap to bind the door mechanism shut. Our goal is to keep the bad guy out and buy the time needed until the police arrive or you decide to evacuate out the windows or maybe you need time to plan countermeasures should the killer gain access to your room. We can no longer trust a single lock to protect us. Unfortunately, during several recent shootings, the active killer has been able to gain entry to a lockdown room and injure or kill the occupants. And while enhanced lockdown is a significant improvement to past practices, the best option is always to flee the building and gather at predetermined rally points on or near the school campus. If a lockdown announcement is made, it should include life-saving information such as interior lockdown, man with a gun near the library, interior lockdown, man with a gun near the library. These few additional lines empower the building occupants to quickly decide what is the best option for them. Obviously, if you hear shooting right outside your door, heading into the hallway to evacuate is not a safe option. It's time for you to lock down and fortify. However, if you're on the other side of the campus in the gym, you know it's time to flee. No longer are we relying upon a single building response. Rather, how you respond is determined by where you are within the building at the time the shooting starts. After considering fleeing or enhanced lockdown, our final strategy is countermeasures. So whether you are locked down or you find yourself in the common areas like a cafeteria or a hallway, be prepared to keep the active shooter from hurting you. In order to accurately shoot, stab, or strike you, they need to be able to acquire a target and successfully strike. Rally those around you and throw objects at the person's face and head to deny him a clean line of sight. If you encounter an intruder in a hallway, throw whatever is available at his head and face. This will buy precious time to escape. Anything you can do to distract and confuse decreases his ability to accurately fire. Only as a last resort, if you cannot flee, go on the offensive and swarm the intruder. If you decide to swarm, take the killer to the ground and use the collective body weight of your group to hold him in place. And if you come into contact with the weapon, don't pick it up. Rather, cover it up with a trash can and keep the killer from getting it back. You know, nobody likes to think about countermeasures, but if you have no other option, commit yourself to doing what you need to do in order to survive. You will see these same basic strategies packaged in many different forms. However, they all boil down to run, hide, or fight. These are the most basic responses to an active killer. IU-13 has selected the ALICE program offered by Response Options to help us teach these life-saving skills. The ALICE program has been around since 2000, and it is a time-tested program geared toward educators. If you would like more information about how IU-13 can help you train instructors for your school, please contact our Safety and Security Department. Regardless of whether you choose a vendor to help you deliver this material or you decide to build your own program, I think we can all agree this is valuable information that everybody should have. This is a life skill, not just a school skill. These principles apply equally to school, home, work, or the mall. Today we're at the Lancaster County Public Safety Training Center and I'm joined by Detective Jim Zom, the commander of the Lancaster County CERT team. Jim, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Today we're going to spend some time talking about active shooters in schools. Can you talk us through how municipal police officers initially respond to the call of an active shooter at a school? Well, it's changed over the last couple of years. Originally they would respond, they'd wait, they'd get four minimum of four officers, they'd enter the school in a team in formations and they'd track down the active shooter. Now, because that took a lot of time and active shooters last a very short period of time, when they get there, the first officer there goes into school and begins to look for the active shooter. 
And, and do I understand correctly that in many jurisdictions, the SWAT team members, or as we know them today as CERT team members, are often not immediately available to respond. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Most of our SWAT teams across the state of Pennsylvania are uh, part what they call part-time teams. They're not any less trained than a full-time team. Full-time team, they are ready to go at 24-7. They work that way. That's their job. With part-time teams, they have other collateral responsibilities where they can be patrol officers, detectives, supervisors, and have other things that they do throughout the day. When they get the call, they either respond from work or home to the location they need to respond to. Now, you talked about a part-time CERT team member versus a full-time CERT team member. Any real difference in their training? No. No. They, all tra they still have the same categories they have to train in. They still have the same ideas, the same problems, and they have to prepare for the same thing. Okay. Now, once that CERT team arrives at the school, uh, what is their primary mission? Their job would be to do secondary searches, look for secondary suspects that may be hiding, to look for victims, to look for what, you know, secondary devices. They clear the school systematically after the shooting is over. And they're also there in case the would-be shooter would decide to take hostages and lock themselves in a classroom then they would handle that barricade hostage situation to its conclusion. How is the CERT team activated here in Lancaster County? Uh, can a building principal call them and say, hey, I need the CERT team? No, the host jurisdiction, whatever police jurisdiction is on scene, if they feel they need a SWAT team, they notify Lancaster County wide communication, and their supervisor in turn notifies myself or whoever may be working if I'm not available. They run the situation by them, and then we decide if the team should be activated or not. Okay. And, and we seem to hear this term SWAT and CERT. Are, are they interchangeable? What does CERT stand for? Yes, yeah, CERT stands for a Special Emergency Response Team. They are a SWAT team. SWAT, SWAT is Special Weapons and Tactics. It's just that most teams across the country over the years develop their own acronyms to call themselves, but they are all SWAT teams. You know, one of the things we hear as people talk about how CERT teams respond to schools and municipal police respond to schools is that with their initial response, if they're going down a hallway or entering a classroom, they'll actually bypass somebody that's injured. Can you explain why that happens? Yes, the first responding officer, the first one in the school, their job is to neutralize the active shooter so that there isn't any more casualties. Uh, the secondary teams coming in will deal with the wounded and the people who are still in the schools to uh, get them out of the school and get them help. And if I were to be in one of these buildings when there's an active shooter, whether I'm a staff member or a student or a parent visiting, if I were to come into contact with one of those police officers or a CERT team member, what would they be expecting me to do? Listen to what they say. If they tell you to get down, get down. If they tell you to get in the, along the wall, get along the wall. If they tell you to go somewhere, go somewhere. They don't have time to explain why. They don't have time to deal directly with you. We know that they're upset, we know that there's issues, but they have a job to do and they have priorities they must meet first. But they will take care of you uh, later on then. Now we're told that um, based on the history of past school shootings that a lot of times these events are over pretty quickly. Sometimes within six to eight minutes or you might hear about one lasting up to 20 minutes. But yet it seems like it takes hours if not days for the police to finish their work there. Can you talk a little bit about what police do after the shooting's over? Yes, well, the scene becomes a crime scene, and we have to secure it. We have to collect evidence. We have to basically reconstruct the crime. It becomes very vital if the suspect's still alive and goes to trial to, to win our case against them. And once that's done, which could be three days to a week, depending on how serious the situation was, then you have the cleanup, the repairs of the damage, the issues like that, and that usually can shut a school down for a while. Sure. And while some schools might have a school resource officer, a police officer right on campus, often it takes a few minutes for police to first arrive after you realize you have an active shooter at a school. Is there any advice that you could give to, to the occupants of that school about what they should do before the police arrive to help them survive? Yes, if they're able to get out, if the shooter's not anywhere near them, the shooter's on another floor, the shooter's on another end of the building, get out of the school, get their, class, get their classmates, whatever, and get out, get away from the school. 
if they can't get out, then they need to secure, they need to find a room, they need to get locked in, they need to barricade the door, they need to turn out the lights, they need to be really quiet, hoping the shooter will pass them by, looking for a target-rich environment. Uh, and he's probably not going to worry about busting in doors, and that takes too much time. If, the, if they are compromised, if the suspect does come in the room, then they need to use whatever resources they have that are available to protect themselves. Okay. Well, Jim, that was some great advice, and I really thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. As we can imagine, these types of events aren't over just because the bad guy is dead or under arrest. The recovery process is significant and prolonged. Many schools that have experienced active shooters and multiple fatalities report that the school culture is changed forever. But we also realize that we need to wake up the following morning and begin to figure out what the new normal is going to look like and how we can start helping people put their lives back together again. The school's staff, students, families, community, along with first responders, will all need to grieve, memorialize, reflect, share, and begin healing. And while it's a shared community experience, the process of restoration is often an individual journey. Group discussions and access to quality counseling for individuals is critical. Within days of an active shooter, it's important to have a thorough debriefing at every level of the school organization and be sure to include the first responders. It would only add to the tragedy should the opportunity to learn, adapt, and change be lost by having not gone through a thorough debriefing. Training and drills are keys to effectively responding to these types of events, and they truly can make the difference between life and death. Following this video, you should spend a few minutes discussing how your school is going to respond when faced with an active killer. Well, thanks for joining us today, and we look forward to continuing this series on all hazards planning in schools, and hope you will join us again as we continue to ask the question, are you ready? Thank you.